on behalf of Emerge Africa, I would like to, uh, to welcome you all to this session that we're doing in collaboration with, uh, with EdTech Hub. Um, we have done um, two other sessions in the past couple of months, um, one on the research frameworks and another that uh, Dr. Matt Smith, who's also here with us today, did on uh, decolonizing uh, research methodology. Um, so this is the, our third workshop in this series um, that we're doing at EdTech Hub. And uh, this time we are focusing on positionality in educational technology research. And we're fortunate to have um, Dr. Nampil Chuma from, uh, the some from Stellenbosch University in South Africa with us, uh, along with uh, Dr. Nicola Pallitz, who is with Rhodes University, uh, also in South Africa with us today. Um, so I will just, um, yeah, just, um, oh, I need to let you all know that this session is being recorded and it will form a part of um, a recording that we will publish on the Emerge Africa um, YouTube channel uh, later on uh, after this session. Um, yeah, Nicola um, and uh, Nampilo. I think I'll give you the, the words. Cool. Thank you very much, Jacob, for the introductions. And we'd just like to, before we start, send everyone, wish everyone a happy Africa Day. So here's a little bit of history about Africa Day and particularly happy Africa Day from the Emerge Africa team as well. So um, here's a little write up especially for our international colleagues, a um, little bit of background about, about Africa Day and how, you know, it's, it's, it's history. It was previously African Freedom, Freedom Day and Liberation Day, and it commemorates the founding of the Organization of African Unity on 25th of May, 1964. So here's a little message from the team because over the years, you know, Emerge Africa has grown a lot and has had, you know, participation of, you know, participants uh, and presenters from over 30 African countries, as well as beyond um, the continent. And even our leadership team includes members from Egypt, Ghana, Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa and Zambia. Um, and there's a lot that we feel we can do to strengthen our professional development and research collaborations across Africa and beyond, um, yet we'll do so from a always solid base, our aim, solid base of experience, expertise and connection. So we wish everyone well with your specific project and perhaps, you know, hopefully today's seminar is useful in that endeavor as well. Um, and your collaborations across Africa as part of our shared endeavor of professional development of e-learning capacity across African higher education and beyond. All right, so today's topic, um, just for a little short agenda, and we can uh, always share the links. Go, yes. the link that, can we get people to just say hi and introduce themselves before we get into our agenda for today? Would love to know where everyone is joining us from. Let me switch on my video too. Um, so if you could just tell us where you're joining us from today and maybe what the weather is like. I'm sitting in Cape Town here and it's been pouring and freezing cold all day. <laughs> so I'm not sure what it's like wherever you are. Please let us know. On microphone or in the chat? Either way is fine with us. Well, my name's Matt. I'm from the UK. Uh, and where I am at the moment, it's glorious, um, which is a heck of a change from how it normally is compared to uh, Cape Town, I can tell you. <laughs> I'd love to join you up there. <laughs> <laughs> Just for today. <laughs> Right, the oh. chat's filling up now, so um, perhaps we'll just I continue with this and we can read. We have Cape Town and we've got San Francisco, where it's sunny. I'm so jealous. <laughs> um, UNICEF in New York. 
Okay. Indian Institute of Technology in India, Netherlands, Wakanda Grahamstown, and Canada. Wow, we have a multinational group joining us today. Um, thank you so much for joining everybody. I'm hoping, and we have Cambridge. Wow, okay. So I'm really looking forward to the session today and I'll hand back to you, Nicola. Thanks. Great, so here's our little outline for today. And I think later on you may need, um, we've got some, you know, for, for an activity, um, the positionality wheel and things. So I'm gonna share the link to the slides now in case I forget. Um, so I've just posted it in the chat. Um, you won't need them right now, but a little bit later on. Yes, indeed, multinational team. Great to have you all here. We'll be starting with sort of defining positionality, also talking about, you know, which spaces may require us to engage with positionality in academia, which may be very different in, you know, San Francisco and the UK, um, Canada. So we also encourage you to share, you know, what's happening in your countries as well around this um, might look a little bit different. So make it for good conversation. We'll talk about why it matters. We'll have an activity around sharing our positionalities, and then we'll share some examples um, of positionality in educational research that we've done, um, followed by a discussion of what does it mean for me and my research, and take it back to the kind of framing of the seminar ser webinar series around decolonial research. Um, and we really invite you, you know, pose questions or share in the chat. Um, uh, you can type M if you'd like to take the, the mic. We hope it's going to be a, you know, a very dis uh, interactive discussion. Okay, so positionality is really multidimensional, and it's quite a contextual concept depending on where you're, where you're at in the world and where you're coming at it from. And there's a lovely quote here from Seven Baden and Major. And they say it entails the position of the researcher in relation to at least three elements of research. Um, and perhaps you agree, or maybe there's something else that you'd add to this, but the specific topic under the investigation, the participants in the study, and the research context and process. Um, yeah, maybe that doesn't quite capture the sometimes intersectionality that and we'll get into that between who we are as researchers and the people that we are doing research with, um, our participants, whether we are insider or outsider researchers and those kinds of dynamics, but we will get more into that. So, okay, this looks a little funny, sorry colleagues, um, but in some you know, applications for ethical clearance when you know, both students and staff uh, at universities, sometimes um, we are required to engage with positionality um, and to highlight potential conflicts of interest. And here's one, just an example from my own university where we've got to declare any conflict of in in interest and provide a consideration of how your particular position in the study may influence it. Um, maybe you want to share in the chat um, whether your university has something similar, perhaps you're a postgrad student or recently completed your postgraduate studies where you had to do something like this. Um, yeah, feel free to let us know. Nampilo, I think you said Stellenbosch has the similar, um, a similar thing. Yes, they do have a similar thing in our faculty specifically. Um, where in the research proposal they will require you to say something about your positionality, particularly if you are an insider researcher. So if you're researching, if you're a lecturer researching students or lecturers or the institution or within your organization in some way, then there's a requirement to, to declare that and what it means for your study. And, and we'll talk a little bit about what that means and how to actually do it. Uh, because I think some students struggle with, so what do I actually write? What do I actually say here? 
Great, and I see Ellen's um, comments. Thanks, Numkila, for fleshing it out. Um, this is in, in in the in the in the US, yes. So the IRB processes. So yes, very much. It, it's like a similar similar thing. And perhaps Matt in in the UK, do you have this? Or anyone uh, that wants to add? Not uh, exactly. There's no um, specific version of this. I mean, uh, most researchers presumably have their own version of it. It's often your positionality is always built into your PhD, for example. You can't kind of escape that. And lecturing at master's and, and doctoral level, it's always evidence, but below that, probably less so. But in terms of researchers researching, I think if you don't know who you are and your own approach to research, your research isn't really going to work you have to wrestle with this i think before before you um but whether you have to put it in a in every paper is a different matter mm. yeah and it's often you know about being explicit about it um in the research and yeah i think that that's a good point though and and we see that in different kinds of research articles to what extent people are being explicit about their position on team. Um. Yeah, and can I just add that for mm -hmm. for us here in South Africa, it's it's kind of a tricky situation uh, because when you look at the history of the country um, and you look at the impact that has had on higher education and what they call institutional differentiation for those who are from outside. South Africa, it's, it's the fact that institutions are placed differently and have different kinds of resources available for academic staff and for students because of where they were in the history of the country. Um, so if they were well resourced, then they are still well resourced now and so on. Uh, so when you look at things like that, it becomes even more important to think about your positionality because you are coming into a, a research context that is not stable, if I can put it like that. It, it's, it's, a, it's a shifting space. Um, so it is important to state who you are and how you understand your context and why you're understanding it from that particular perspective and declare your assumptions uh, because those are important in how you come up to your findings. So I, I think in some sense, the history of the country has had an impact on the importance of being more explicit about our positionality in studies that are done within the country. And the other point, I think in a lot of our universities, there's a lot of you know social justice as part of the mission. Um, I know it's a big part of, you know, strong feature in, in that of my university so that's another i think adding another layer to this um, but i think our international colleagues might be more familiar with this kind of thing so this is a recent um proposal in tech trends that a friend of ours hannah grossman she is part of the, um, the editors for this special issue and <clears throat> So here, this is called a positionality statement. And sometimes I know colleagues in particularly the US, they write it as part of their, like, their online presence. Um, and perhaps even at conferences, at <clears throat> portfolios. And perhaps Ellen, you want to say something about, you know, does this kind of thing look familiar to you? Uh, sorry, I think I've unmuted. Yes, um, you have. Very good. What's fascinating for me is that, um, as, as Tony has noted, that the African uh, experience is going to be, I mean, everybody has their unique experiences. And I think that that clearly, as you pointed out, um, Napilo, I think that was you who was speaking, that, that there are conditions that you know, I'm not going to be looking at some of those same things, although I will say that the concerns for social justice 
and the DEI concerns that we're experiencing are certainly, you know, we're, we're doing a lot of our own sort of national uh, rediscovery, if you will, of, of our own conditions. That's, well, as you're all seeing, it's swirling us around a bit. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'm glad to see Hannah's comments here because she and I have actually talked about this a little bit. I guess for me, because I actually am not, I mean, I'm a researcher, but I also come to this more recently working in corporations and being an education voice in corporations. And so some of the positionality that, that I tend to deal with is maybe not so much the, the political issues, but it's certainly the economic issues and the conditions around commerce, which are, some would, tell, would say that that's almost as, as dark as the, well, it is another version of the colonialization. So frankly, I guess I, I'm, I don't have a lot of perspectives on this, which is why I'm here. I mean, I, this is an issue, this whole conversation about the decolonization of research has been something that uh, I, I think many of you know that I've been associated with an organization in the US called AECT and had a chance, the opportunity to help lead that group for a while this last couple of years. And the idea of the, the perspectives that all of us are trying to bring together in these very interesting times, it's just a, an opportunity to, to get a lot smarter. That, that's all I can say. I think most of, us, most of us feel like we have to deal with the positionality of the context of our, of our reflections is clearly driven by the conditions under which we work. And we can't necessarily assume that any of our conditions are going to be all that comparable. But I do think looking for commonalities among some of these different types of experiences, the positional experiences is, well, looking at what I'm looking at right now and some of the emergence of the artificial intelligence um, conversations, this is gonna be increasingly uh, significant. So sorry for the meandering, but it's, I don't know. And I want to know more about what we can do to be able to help manage this. Thank you so much, Ellen. <clears throat> and yes, you are an ACT legend. And no. I remember the wonderful town hall meetings and you know what you, you know, I think you, you, you might not realize, but some of the kind of decolonial spirit is someone who always listens. I, you know, I always admire, admire you for that. Um, well, well, I appreciate that. And it is because of that AECT experience mm -hmm. and speaking with so many different people about some of these intricacies that many of us for, forget that while we are, anybody doing research wonders if anybody's paying attention. You always mm -hmm. wonder if anybody is, if, if you're going to have that impact. I think I realized while at AECT that associations of people like us uh, seek each other out because we have been personally driven to be those people who look beyond the obvious. But none of us individually really feel like we have a voice. And I say that, I mean, sometimes people say, well, Ellen, you've had a, a, an opportunity to have a voice. And the thing is, is that you wonder if anybody actually even hears what you say. So I, I think most of us are sort of longing for legitimacy and longing for recognition and that perhaps one of the human conditions that we as, as researchers and scholars have to accept at some point is that every one of us is trying, to, is trying to push the envelope in ways that most people aren't gonna understand. And so is it positionality? Probably. Can we do better together? I hope so. But, it's, but I think most of us struggle with trying to find a voice. So um, uh, this is why I'd actually prefer to sort of listen today than <laughs> to say much more. Yeah, and I think that's part of the reflection, like how do we, you know, sometimes, and, and that's in spaces where maybe we have power, don't realize it, places where, or times, and we'll share through the examples of, you know, just, you know, not having power versus having mm -hmm. power in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, and through the kind of levels of privilege, engaging and, and kind of, becoming conscious of the levels of privilege that we do have. Um, yeah, Nampino, would you like to add anything to what Ellen shared? No, I'll, I'll expand on the discussion when we get to the next slide, thanks. Ah, wonderful. Yeah. Okay, over to you, Nampino. All right, um, so as Nicola indicated uh, earlier on, 
in um, within our institutions, we are required to state our positionality in various spaces. It could be the Research Ethics Committee, it could be the High Degrees Master's and Doctoral Proposal Committee, um, it could be in the actual thesis itself. But I think it is important to note that it's mainly for particular kinds of studies. Mm -hmm. um, I think there was an indication in the chat, I think it was probably from you, Ellen, around education and social sciences research. No, I think that was Tony's comment, yeah. Oh, it was yeah. Tony. Okay, there we go. All right, yeah, I see it now. Around education and the social sciences being more mm -hmm. politicized. So for absolutely. us who are in, sorry? Hey, absolutely. I, I, that, that's a condition that we just have to put on the table because of course it's been that way, yeah. Yeah, so, so because that research is more politicized, then it calls on us to be more reflective about what our positionality is. Um, and when we are looking at your positionality in a lot of instances, people, actually a lot of papers that you read and I'm working on a review paper at the moment, you'll find people look, well, we'll state I'm an insider in this way and this mm. is what this means for my study or I'm an outsider in this way and this is what it means for our study. And it's interesting when they have that dichotomy, that insider, outsider, and you will see from the way that people write about these two concepts that they have particular understandings of what it means. Uh, at times they'll show how being an insider is actually a disadvantage in this way or that way. And they had to bring in outsiders because they wanted to maintain objectivity and that kind of thing. And it, it's also in, been interesting for me in, in reading about these concepts that you'll find some researchers view this on a continuum because you can never be fully an insider or fully an outsider. There are always different levels and people name them differently. <laughs> there some would say an inside outsider or something to that effect. Um, so if I'm an academic and I'm researching academics in a particular discipline, if I'm not within that same discipline, then there is some element of being an outsider. So there are different levels, even in this insider-outsider dichotomy. And it's important to recognize that uh, when we are writing about our positionality. Okay, And then it's also important to recognize that when you are researching the, the institution, the, the, the wider institution, um, students, maybe you send out a survey to all postgraduate students or something like that, or to academics, or you're in, in, um, researching um, executive management within the institution, then it's a very different kind of positionality from researching your own classroom practice, because the power dynamics within that space are different from every other space within the institution. Uh, so you need to think about what that means for your study. How are students going to respond, not knowing what uh, your research means for their success within the course? It doesn't matter how much you assure them <laughs> that it's actually not going to make a difference uh, in your marks, whether you participate in the study or you don't. And please be honest, it makes it difficult. And I found, at least with our research ethics committee, they they kind of frown on studies where you are um, researching the students that you are currently teaching. Uh, and they encourage people, of course, you have to motivate it and you can motivate it. Like if you're doing an action research study, for example, um, but they'll say rather let the students finish and then you can study the students so that it doesn't have an impact on their learning, you know? So, there's, a, there's an interesting power dynamic there that you have to really think about and reflect on uh, and what that means for your study. And if you are also uh, researching ethic interventions or support and so on, that is also different. Uh, and when I get to my reflection later on, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this and what that meant for a study that I was doing and for my positionality, I actually saw myself as a vulnerable insider researcher um, and in different ways. I'm not going to preempt that, so I, I will pause there. Thanks. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you, Tony. 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 Thank you, Ellen. Thank you,
Okay, so why does it matter? Why, why do we actually need to um, reflect on our positionality? Um, not all papers do it. And I, I worry sometimes that there's those, those who do do it are those in the social sciences and so on particularly, and more specifically for qualitative studies. But it's interesting when you reflect on, on what research is. For me to plan a research study, it doesn't matter whether it's a qualitative or if I'm going to be getting qualitative or quantitative data or if it's a mixed method study. The point is, I'm the one who determines what the study is going to be about, right? I figure out what the research questions are. If Nicola and I gave each other topics, okay, let's look at this topic. You look, look, you look at it in your own institution. I'll look at it in my own institution. And we just give each other the topics, the focus. We are both going to come up with different research questions. We are most likely going to come up with different methods, different methodology, different methods, and different theories for framing that study. So it doesn't matter whether the study ends up being a qualitative study or a quantitative study. And it shows to me, that actually reveals to me that um, who we are determines very strongly the kinds of things that we research. And if we are explicit about who we are and our relation to the study as a result of this positionality, then it actually adds to the reliability of our, our, our studies. It also adds to the rigor of, of, uh, of the research. Okay. Um, so I, I kind of have an issue when people say, no, but my study is completely objective. I, 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 I doubt there's a study that is fully objective. <laughs> we can try for some level of objectivity, but the point is you have determined some aspect of that. And that came out of your knowledge and your experience and your assumptions about the context um, and your knowledge about the discipline and so on. Thank you. Okay, great. So I think it's time for some conversation. I've just muted my video because I noticed we had a few participants who were probably uh, chucked out of Zoom and had to re-enter. Um, so I'm just conscious of that being a little bit more high bandwidth. Um, so if I can ask colleagues who haven't muted video, if you could just do the same. Um, but you're free to you know, see how it goes in the breakout rooms. So. I've shared the link to the slides. I can do so again. Um, basically, you know, we thought let's have a discussion and share our positionalities in terms of who we are in our spaces. And this is not recorded as it's happening in breakout rooms and how it impacts the research that we either are doing or want to do um, because they are different. Uh, yeah, very, as we said, it's really contextual. This is called on the right a uh, positionality wheel. It comes from not a South African context, but it gives you some idea that there are these levels of privilege, right? So if we look at education, you know, is, a, is it limited? Is it none? Does the person have a degree? Uh, and certain things give people either more or less privilege in a different space. It's not that this is always um, the case. Um, so yeah, white, various shades, dark skin color, race, um, disability. It could be um, sort of class, social class. Yeah, they call it childhood, household wealth. And there's so many aspects. So you can pick out a few and talk about these levels of privilege um, in, in your context. Uh, does that make sense? Or would is there anyone who'd like us to explain a little bit more before we head to breakout rooms? Um, before we, we, we do, can I also just mention that these are different depending on the context. For example, um, when we were having our, our discussion with, with Nicola in preparation for this session, I was just saying that in some contexts, you'll find if you are a married woman, then you have more pri privilege 
than a single woman, right? But in other contexts, it's the other way around because someone who is a single woman uh, is viewed as is, is viewed quite differently. They're available for different tasks. They don't have childcare duties. They don't have this and that. And more opportunities are open to them as a result, you know. And then in, in some situations, age matters. So if you are older, then you have more privilege than someone who is younger. So a lot of these depend on the context. And they actually depend on what it is that you are researching. Okay, so I mean, a lot of the times we'll talk about um, the white male and the level of privilege that white male who is younger has in a context. But if that white male comes and does a study here and does it in the township here in Cape Town where I am, then the kind of research they are going to, to, to do or rather the results or the data they are going to get would be very different than if I did that same study. So depending on what the research is about, I might actually have more privilege in that context than the young white men. So while um, we will say certain, um, certain of these concepts have got more privilege generally, um, it's not always the case. It will depend on the context. It will depend on the kind of research that is being done and so on. And those are the kinds of things that would like for you to reflect on. So what does your gender mean for your study? How does that impact your study? Um, what does your skin color mean for, 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 for your study? Yeah, I, I mentioned age because I, I thought it's an important one. But I know it's not there on, on, on this particular wheel. And there are many wheels. You can find them online. Um, but I felt that age is actually an important one. And there's so many others. Um, when we're having a discussion with other colleagues a few weeks ago around this, things like your personality can matter for the kind of study that you're doing. So for those people who are extroverts and more outgoing, they may be able to get particular kinds of data in particular contexts than someone who is an introvert and is extremely shy. You know, so it's different things. And it's important to reflect about who you are. If you just think, okay, who I am, who am I rather in terms of my race, my gender, uh, my education, my ability, my body size, my height, and so on. And what does that mean for my research in terms of my knowledge even about this discipline, my level of education, the kind of work that I'm doing now. So if I'm a full professor or if I'm a junior lecturer or I'm a postgraduate student, what impact that does, does that have on my research? So I know we've given you other ideas which are not necessarily on this wheel. This is just an example of one, um, but we will go into our breakout rooms now. And, and as Nicola said, if anyone has any questions or needs clarification on any of these, please let us know before we send you to the breakout rooms. Is it for, how long is it for Nicola? Can't remember. So we had 20 minutes, but I'm just wondering, do we want to, okay, we've just had a few more people. Do we want three groups of four or do we want two bigger groups? Let's do three groups of four. I think let's keep maybe the dis discussions shorter than the 20 minutes so that we have time to mm. discuss together. Yeah. Okay. So 10 minutes, maybe let's say 10 minutes so that oh. we have time for feedback and because we still have a bit of the presentation left. And I'm going to assign automatically. Okay. All right. Didn't give me a chance to give the time. <laughs> Maybe I hope you could. Oh, we can just call them back in manually. It's fine. Okay. You know how. So we're going to do that for 10 minutes. Yes.
I see Lena is still here. Are you able to join a group, Lena? But some of the groups are small. There's a group with just two people. Let me join them. Thank you. So I'm disappearing. I'm going to join that other group. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> I'll join one as well. Um, will there be someone here in case someone else joins the meeting late? I Just see Jakob is on non-participating, but he might have may have left. I don't mind staying here, but you know, there's a lot of you know people from different countries, and I suppose you know not really familiar with one another's con con context so there's probably a lot more explaining you had to do um but yeah let us know how it went did you feel comfortable um was it awkward was it interesting yeah a little bit of a report back uh, from members of our breakout breakout rooms oh matt said it felt too short glad you were enjoying yourself even lena <laughs> Having moaned that 20 minutes was too long, it went like that. <laughs> but our group was brilliant. I, I, I'll jump in. Um, we barely spoke about the wheel. We were just talking about positionality itself and the three of us and our different kind of experiences and understandings of it. And it was just it was a really fascinating conversation. Yeah, I think we'd love to hear from each group what are the key things that are important to talk about in in terms of positionality in your own context, in your space. Um, I, I think from, from my own angle, um, um, I looked at um, the aspect of culture, looked at, um, I um, talked about the aspect of uh, religion, talking about the aspect of climate in terms of the environment, um, some of the things that shape one's upbringing uh, up to adulthood and uh, being uh, coming into research, um, you tend to bring all of these things um, into, it, it reflects in whatever um, academic uh, rights of one is making. And uh, sometimes when you tend to communicate with um, the global community, you tend to have um, different standards and uh, that um, at, at some point the position has to be um, reshaped. That's, uh, mm. Thank you so much, Manuel. Are you, are you done? I think I'm having that issue. Are you done, Emmanuel? Okay, I hope he is done. Thanks so much for sharing those points. Okay, anyone else would like to share with us? What are the key aspects of your positionality that are important for the kind of research that you are doing? Whether it's things you've used before, or things that you're only thinking about now as a result of our discussion so far. Maybe you hadn't thought about them before, or maybe from the conversations that you were having in the groups, what kinds of things have occurred to you? This is Danielle. I was uh, in the in the group with Emmanuel, and one thing he said that got me thinking was, uh, he, you know, he was talking about his context and um, how in his context, he was used to describing gender as he or she, but then, you know, with time, he got exposed to, you know, a non-binary genders. And um, so one thing is that your your position can change. So let's say you publish an article at one stage of your life and your position is declared as a certain thing as one time. Uh, you Yeah, you declare your position as one thing at that time. Uh, later, you might uh, change your position, but your position was that at the time. Uh, a different thing is uh, how you perceive your own position. And so if you declare your, your position, so 
for example, I would declare myself as a woman and, uh, do, you know, if I were doing a gender based uh, research, for example, and I were examining a group um, of men uh, doing some, doing different activities, I would declare myself as a woman. But just because I declare myself as a woman doesn't mean, for example, that I have feminist views. So there are you can declare your position, uh, but it's important to also declare your bias. But no matter what you're saying, it's still your perception of you saying that. So you can declare your position, but uh, when other people read it, okay, they, they read it, but uh, they still have to be careful about how they interpret what you're saying because you, you, you think you're being accurate, you think you're being honest, and that's the best you can do, but it's still, your position is still your perception of what you think it is. Thank you so much, um, Danielle. You raise uh, a really important point, which I'll reflect on in the next slide when I talk about <clears throat> a paper on positionality that I wrote about. And it is important to remember, this is how I perceive it and others may view it differently. And how do we bring about that balance and try to ensure we balance what we think of ourselves and how others perceive it. Thank you so much for sharing that. I see some comments in the chat. There's one from Gregory um, telling us about the experience in Kenya and other countries within Africa and how the elderly have much respect, portray, believe to portray positive energy, um, believed to be wise compared to youngsters uh, when it comes to consultations they have to be considered first and it looks like it's the same in India um, if I can just India. add one word yeah. there about India yes um, please we have also had training sessions where I was training and I was I think one year younger then and one of the feedback was given that you should really have older people okay and I was just th thinking, I mean, the whole thing about that person was age. And even if the same training was provided, they would rather have an older person delivering the training. And then there's so many things that affect the way we do the research or we collect data from the people after the research. Yeah, I just wanted to add this thing. Thanks. Thank you so much for expanding on that point. Um, so not just in, in, in research, it doesn't only impact research, but it also impacts um, our other work. So, I mean, this shows how important it, has, it is for us to reflect on these positionalities and how they actually have a ripple effect on the kind of work that we do in academia. Uh, so thanks, Lena, for, for sharing that. Um, and I'm sure others have had similar uh, experiences. I know of someone who was... Um, us, but we thought they were sending a man, <laughs> you know, so people have, have similar experiences, but from different, different views. Uh, Nicola, do you want to say your comment? Um, I see Tony has his hand up. Okay, should I talk? Yes, please go ahead, Tony. Okay, I've been delegated by Kefas to report from our group. <laughs> um, where I started out by declaring many areas of privilege and said, I need to be very conscious of these things because otherwise I'm going to end up doing things that are very stupid. Um, and then Kefas came in and said, actually, in relation to many of these areas of privilege, I'm exactly the opposite of you, except for the fact in Zambia, and I guess as would be in many African countries, um, being white doesn't give you any particular privilege. Um, and we ended up with a discussion which focused a lot about issues around age and whether being in your late, the late part of your career counts in your favor or not. Um, and then right at the end, there was a conversation about um, whether as you go further, as you get older and you do more postgrad research and get more qualifications, if your privilege can actually change. I'll stop there. Maybe KFS has, has something to bring in as well. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for the, sharing. The, uh, um, KFS? Uh, yeah, so I think 
Tony has covered uh, uh, the most part of our conversation in the breakout room. And uh, just to add on that, um, yeah, so in... I, I think it's 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 probably a culture or, or traditional uh, uh, sentiment where, um, uh, especially in Africa, and I can see also in India where they uh, there's a perception that um, an older person is more wise and and um, more knowledgeable. So if you 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 are you are probably offering a training, they pay more attention to someone who's older because they they it, it's it's naturally perceived that they, are, they have more experience, they have seen a lot of things, and they are not just speaking from the book, they are speaking from the things that have, they have experienced. And even in the learning circles, um, I was talking about what, what happened when I was doing my post-grad. Um, older people are, 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 tend to find it easy when they are learning, even the lecturers are soft on them, they are more respected in class and things like that as compared to, to, to the young lads, yeah. Yeah, so clearly age is quite a, a, a big issue. I mean, Matt in the chat here is presenting um, an opposite view of age. And he says in much of the global north, all the members of society are very often seen as out of touch and unable to reach the, the younger population. Um, so it, it, it's interesting to see how in different parts of the world, age has got, um, yeah, it's viewed differently for our research studies and has a different impact on the way we conduct it and how we are perceived as researchers. Um, any other comments? So <laughs> Ellen mentions professional maturity. Um, and then Danielle brings in the idea of language. Nicola, do you want to comment? I think that plays a big role. So Danielle, Danielle was saying, you know, I've seen trainings with the trainer was more respected if they spoke better French. Um, and were those trainings, I don't know, who are the people, who are, are they? Um, French speakers, is it mixed? Is it considered to be more of an asset to be fully bilingual? Um, maybe you can tell us a bit more about that, Danielle. Um, so here in Canada, you can have people who speak uh, perfect, perfect English, and it's the only language they speak. You can have people who are bilingual, English, French, and they can have perfect, perfect English, perfect French, or all the way to uh, English that's okay, French that's okay, and then you've got the uh, then the other end, which is people who speak uh, only French and they speak it perfectly, and that's ignoring any other languages that that a person might have. Um, and the thing is, is that there's a lot of environments where people who are bilingual, uh, you know, they're not perfect at e at either language, and so you'll you might have a trainer who is delivering training intended to be completely in French. Uh, but you have a person who's bilingual, their French isn't, isn't perfect, and uh, you'll have people in the audience who are listening, and their French might not be perfect either, but you can tell by listening whether someone's language is, is good or not, and someone's language level is good. And uh, a person who is speaking and who is not uh, clear, articulate, using the right vocabulary, using the right grammar, they'll be, uh, as a trainer, they'll be less respected uh than, than someone who who's uh, who's got it who and and the reason i i can point that out is just because in in canada language is such a big deal uh between english and french it's a very very political issue and so it's something that comes up a lot and that's not even considering indigenous languages so uh, yeah th there's a lot tied to to language it's, it's something that is valued very strongly Thank you very much. Um, we've had such interesting insights. I don't want to close anyone out before we move on to our next slide. Are there any other insights from our discussions? So Ellen commented and said, so basically positionality is about navigating interpersonal dynamics. So it's like, it's like yes and no. 
it's kind of it's it's weird it's, it's a very weird thing to explain because actually yes it's partly that but it's also how do those dynamics impact research and i think yeah i put i put that in the chat but i think also research in different spaces because it can look you know like danielle's example person not speaking perfect french here you know if i try <laughs> Greetings in the local language. It's like, oh well, she's a white chicky and she tried. Yay, good for her. Um, you know, suddenly it, it's it's not it's not frowned upon. Um, so yeah, I think it very much depends on on where you are, uh, but also how you have particular um, privilege tied to those different dynamics. Um, and the intersection between these things. So it's often, it's not just language, it could be gender, age, language, and how those things come together. So yeah. is that you, Nompila? Yes, I just wanted to add to your point. Um, it, it does, as you, as you responded to Ellen, that it does relate to interpersonal dynamics in some sense. Um, but if we go back to our definition uh, right at the beginning, we showed mm -hmm. that when you're looking at positionality, you're actually looking at how you relate, not just to the people. And that's what we've talked about mostly, how we relate to the people or the participants that we are researching. But you're also looking at how you relate to the context, how you relate to the research problem uh, that yes. you are going to look at. So I, I think it has to do with your knowledge and understanding of the context. Um, it has to do with your understanding of what the research problem actually is and how you conceptualize it. So it goes beyond just the interpersonal between you and, and the other researchers you may be working with or the participants. Yeah, it, it, it goes a little bit beyond that. But we, we focus on that because I think that's the one that's front and center for us. That's the one that you experience, even if you haven't sat down to think about. Okay. It's the first step. It's the first place where we start to engage with each other, which is yes. where, you know, saying it as basically, I, I, I don't mean to infer that it's not essential or uh, because but but the basic first step of of engaging with individuals around topics and finding where we come together, mm -hmm. uh, it it is a matter of it's it's like it's like finding common ground, isn't it? Yes. And and I mean, but two things: it's finding common ground, but also making certain that that the the attributes of a particular perspective are clearly articulated, so that we do appreciate that. Um, that, that it, it, there's a lot going on. I, I mean, I'm sorry that that sounds so silly, but it is just we, we're we're navigating multiple layers of discourse uh, in so many of these interactions. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. I mean, it also has to do with our assumptions and their assumptions and expectations and relationships. <laughs> it's, mm -hmm, it's, it's mm -hmm. quite layered. It's quite layered, as you say. Well, and in this research conversation, what I'm appreciating is that you know, this is pursuit of new knowledge and that I have to always frame my questions to you all with the perspective that, that you are developing knowledge creators who need to have a clear understanding that knowledge creation is influenced by many, many things. You know, I, I don't live in the world that many of you uh, are currently living. So for me, being able to take all those perspectives and apply them toward uh, changing behaviors based on evidence it, it, it's again, it's a different part of this conversation. And I must, I, I do have to remind myself that that really my perspectives on a lot of this are less about the research drivers or the personality of the researchers or the drivers of the, of the research as it is the application of your research in practice to achieve different ends. And that's a different, a whole different part of this conversation. Uh, important, but it really is, I mean, where you all is, is really, it's the it's the fundamental beginnings of these conversations as opposed to the applications of their results. 
Thank you for thank you for letting thank me sort you. of put that through. I'm I'm I appreciate that that I actually am working this out loud, <laughs> and then I appreciate. You know that that is fine. Thank you for your willingness to do that. And there's a, another comment from Matt in the chat. I don't know Matt if you want to, to share your comment by audio. It's well, there's a lot of it, I'm afraid, and my group heard it already. But for me, positionality is around knowing who you are as a researcher and letting other people know who you are as a researcher so that mm -hmm. everything that follows all your findings all of your even the way that you went about doing it can't be argued with because it's coming from this place so that if i believe that mathematically i can get an answer by getting everyone to rank all the best ways of doing something out of 10 and then ask 100 people and the one with the most points that's the best way there's my answer that's one way of doing it. But if I don't believe in that mathematical, statistical, positivist way of doing things, and I much prefer asking loads mm. of people their opinions and thematically working out what they're saying and then putting that out there as an answer, whichever, if, if I do it that way, that will give me one answer. That might give me a similar answer, but the whole method, you know, I can't do, I can't believe in a mathematical answer and ask lots of questions and I can't, think oh what interpretivism is what fine and then ask only statistical questions so everything follows in that golden thread as i've kind of put there from ontology to epistemology to methodology to your methods and then your findings will follow that and you know i kind of talked to most of my students about that and certainly at doctoral level exposing that right at the start i am a an interpretivist and a social constructivist with this <laughs> and that and the other that will everything that follows the next eighty thousand words will only make sense in the light of understanding who you are. And I think, I think uh, maybe not for every piece of research and every paper, as I said at the start, but certainly for um, at, at, at a certain level, you have to know where the research is coming from. I don't know if that's helpful, but I, I, also yes, listen, I was gonna, I've got to go in just a few minutes because I'm on school pickup. Yeah, please go ahead, yes, um, you have your time. So there's, um, you can do the special issue later on, but the one thing that I really want to offer out, and a, a lot of people here won't need this, but I have some time and some funding to support uh, writers towards publication. And I know it, it can be difficult for certain people to get published and to get through those, those gateways, especially looking at your wheel, the further you are on the outside of the wheel, the harder it is potentially. I would like to offer up some opportunities for people to just literally meet with me like this in smaller groups, one to one, one to two, one to three, um, bring some writing, bring some ideas, and we'll just have a chat and a, a conversation around writing, around publishing, and around gateways to publication. If you're interested in that, um, you can either drop a message in there, you can email me, I'll put my uh, email in there, um, and then I will work with Jacob to actually literally open up some of these um, possibilities just to have a space online where we can meet, we can chat, you can share your writing and we can talk about it because I'm really passionate about supporting um, everybody towards publication. And that's just what our um, special issue is about. And it's what some of this, this entire writing workshop series is about, helping people to write, helping people to get published. So um, I'll do that and I will get off. Thank you for the opportunity to um, say that. And I will see you hopefully on another one of these. Thank you so much, Matt. I think um, we can move on to our next slide, Nicola. And thank you, Matt, as well. You know, it's a really lovely offer. I'm sure you're going to get some folks taking you up on that. Um, yeah, so we're going to get into our examples now. And yeah, go ahead, Nopila, your one's up first. OK, um, so this is an example of an article Sorry. that I wrote. <laughs> I guess it's coming still. Oh, there we go. Okay. So this is an example of an article that I wrote where I was reflecting on my insider positionality. And um, in this paper, I'll just talk about a few of the things that came out. But otherwise, the paper is available. If you can't access it through your institutional databases, please just drop me an email and I'll send you a copy of the paper. Um, so I call myself a vulnerable insider. That is my the positionality that I felt I inhabited. And the, the reason for that, one of the main reasons is that 
I felt I had conflicting positionalities. So I was a PhD student. This was for my PhD studies. So I was a PhD student. I was an academic developer and I was a lecturer. And I felt those positionalities were, were in conflict at certain times during my research as I was collecting my study, as I was collecting um, my, my data. Um, so there were shifting power dynamics. So at times when I'm going into a particular situation, the data that I collected was from academics in the institution where I worked at the time, which was Rhodes University. Um, so when I would go into a research situation, sometimes it would be difficult to separate, um, it would be difficult for me and it would be difficult for the participants at times to separate whether this is for the research or this is for my work role as an academic developer or is this for, for those who are doing our courses? Is this actually uh, as part of my role in teaching those courses? Where does it actually fit in? And sometimes we'd have to make that explicit. At times when I'm looking at the data later on, I'd have to say to myself, no, but I actually don't think they wanted me to include this. <laughs> I don't think they would want me to include this. Although I asked them specifically in the interview and they seemed fine with it. But anyway, I'll check with them later on. But that, those kind of conflicting positionalities made it difficult for me. Um, and, and I mean, I had instances where I felt the people that I was interviewing had more power than I had. So I would go into that research situation or research space, not actually knowing how to handle things um, or handle various issues. And I elaborate on some of these in the paper. Um, but in some of those instances, I'll have the person put me at ease. They would, they would actually see how nervous I am and go out of their way to make sure that I am relaxed. And sometimes I'll have the opposite um, situation where I go into a research context and the person wants to make sure that I feel their power. <laughs> uh, and they would um, request my assistance or technical services, even in roles that were not assigned to me and I ended up having to do them because in a sense I'm begging for for the data that I need from you so I will do what you need from our office even if it's something that I'm actually not supposed to do at times you'd have access to confidential data which is linked to your job or which was linked to my job and I'll debate about how how do I deal with this I'm not going to include this particular data in my study, but it has actually influenced the way I understand what this person has told me about their role. So how do I separate that, you know? Um, and at times you'd have people making assumptions about what you know and understand about their situation. So people don't complete sentences because they assume you know what they're talking about. <laughs> Um, and sometimes because I was coming in as a black woman, if I'm interviewing another black woman, the assumptions would be multiplied, you know, and it was difficult for me sometimes to explain to them that no, actually my experience is different from yours because I'm not coming in as a black South African, I'm coming from another country. So I don't fully understand the experience that you're talking about. And you're making assumptions about that experience. Um, so it was a, an, an, an interesting set of reflections and I eventually shared them in this, in this paper. But what was really important for me and, and it's important for, for people who are thinking about reflecting on their positionality, um, you have to avoid what they call navel gazing. <laughs> where you're so self-absorbed, you're just talking about yourself and, okay, this is my positionality, this is what it means and so on. You have to relate that to the wider research, to the bigger picture. So someone who reads what you have written about your positionality, they need to be able to draw larger lessons from what you have written. Okay, and there are ways of doing that. They are reflective approaches and models and so on 
what I used for my own study uh, in the PhD, and I refer to it briefly in this paper, is that I drew on other people's research to compare my experience to theirs. I also drew on theory very strongly. So my, my reflections were strongly grounded in theory. Um, and then I also drew from um, what other people said. So when I, I shared the, the transcripts with the participants, I drew from what they said because I wanted to make sure, yes, they've said this, but am I really understanding it the way they want me to understand? So that was an important part of how I reflected on my understanding of the data and on the research that I did. So it's important that when you are reflecting on your positionality and writing about your positionality, it's not just about you and how you relate to your research. You need to go beyond navel gazing. Thank you. Thank you, Nompila. And any questions for Nompila about the, um, her, her experience and example she shared? I see Danielle says, yes, yeah, sometimes the research participants have more power than the researcher can be threatening. Especially when they want you to feel their power, it makes it worse. <laughs> yeah. Ellen, that's true. The, the self-reflection can be less relevant than we think. It feels important to us, mm -hmm. but you have to ask yourself, what does that mean for everybody else? And sometimes there are these moments where it becomes clear or you didn't see it before, but, and yeah, I'll show in the next example, or just share, um, there are sometimes people bring it up and you hadn't thought of it. You never perhaps thought that it was going to be um, something was going to be an issue. Yeah, I think we can move ahead. Oh. There's a comment from Manisha. Yeah, Manisha, I see you've just gotten here and we've got only 10 minutes left. <laughs> I don't know how much, um, how useful it's going to be, but I excellent. hope there might still be some value. Uh, I think it is really excellent. Um, you know, this is so <laughs> true um, because um, I, I'm supervising a team of five master's students and uh, two of them are related to each other. Um, it's, so, oh, wow. you know, tensions of um, previous family relationships um, and another theme which was uh, coming was that um, they all are working, so they feel they're not appreciated, most of them. Um, you know, so, so another theme is like lateral balance within, within um, the First Nations in Canada on reserve. Uh, I, I, think, I hope you are able to share your slides or link to this, this uh, please, because it is so valuable. Um, yes, I, I've shared the slides in the chat and um, we'll also, um, there'll uh, be a recording on the Emerge Africa YouTube channel, um, perhaps your students can go and have a look at it. Um, yeah, but I'm just going to share a really short example, um, you know, folks can have a, you know, read through the paper, but essentially it was about, you know, there was a lot of research about emergency remote teaching and learning during the pandemic power dynamics, you know, often the kind of first responders were your educational technology um, in our space, they call, we called ed tech specialists, but I'm also in a, both a service and academic role. Um, so I'm actually at senior lecturer level. Um, in other spaces, it might have been instructional designers. Um, so there's different labels all over. So, but essentially we support the lecturers and helping them to um, teach online during the pandemic. And what we found that actually being inside a researchers at that time, you know, we were supporting the lecturers. There was a lot of trust. There was a lot of rapport, um, you know, and, and actually also sometimes emotional support because they were very sometimes self-conscious um, and I'm not always confident in initially checking things with us and like, no, that's fine. That looks great. Um, yeah. But we also, you know, realized it was at that moment, we also had a lot of power because we had access to systems data that informed how we were advising the lecturers. So we said, well, look, here is our Moodle stats, how students are accessing the LMS. 
most of them are using mobile phones. Um, so we need to, that's why we need this low tech approach. Um, and it was, this article was really about how lecturers were doing um, low tech emergency remote teaching and learning. It wasn't the sort of high bandwidth Zoom. Yes, we had that, that came later, but initially people were very sensitive to their students' needs and the constraints we face in South Africa where many of our students do not have reliable connectivity. So how this came up actually also, so this, this is just a little contrast where at that time, we were very aware of supporting lecturers across different approaches, um, how the university was shifting in response. Um, and yeah, it was, it, was, it was a fascinating time. It was at the time, I think, quite difficult. We were, one of the things that we had wanted to do is to sh have like a little, you know, good practice guide, but this, this was not what, you know, we knew. It wasn't the, the lecturer's best. It was, they were just doing what they could to cope. Uh, and some had really good strategies. Um, and it was a very emotional experience. So we felt it wasn't going to be ethical, actually putting out and making a kind of collection of stories like that. Um, is it something that they would want to see out there in five years time? Um, but we instead wrote this paper about lecturers' um, approaches one was actually talking about how she, you know, sought uh, counselling because she was so stressed out about not being able to reach her students and her students not not abling, being able to to connect with her. So yeah, and, and this was I think just the other thing I wanted to mention about this. It 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 was yeah, it was also during a time where. You know, people who were supporting lecturers had more power um, in their spaces than before, I think, in, in, in these roles. And the lecturers, sometimes in an interview, they're like, oh, well, we did what you taught us. We did what you told us about the low tech. And so I did, you know, I was inspired by this and then I did that. And it's like, okay, well, the interview is not, <laughs> you know, did we do or did you do what we, we advised you to do? It's more like, well, what 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 did you find um, was a good approach through your experiences with, with emergency remote teaching for your particular students? So, yeah, any questions? Maybe the story resonates with you. Maybe you've done uh, some similar research. Mm -hmm. uh, I've not done research on this topic, but we all went through the COVID um, and we had to provide support to our uh, instructors. Um, most of our instructors are really uh, low, low tech. Like, so there's a lot of training uh, for all sorts of open literacy, digital literacy, instructional design literacy, and um, how to use even simple tools such as Jamboard, Padlet uh, to interact with students. Um, I, I, however, um, we we used uh, we made online sharing circles as a form of indigenous pedagogy. We used, um, you know, because we are an um, indigenous college on a reserve, um, so uh, integrating indigenous pedagogy with instructional technology or educational technology um, re really worked um, because. Every, we were all learners, you know, our um, um, instructors, our lecturers needed a lot of support, you know. So we started a micro learning program, which was professional development. Uh, I, I think the previous example you were showing was just in time professional development. Um, so, oh, it's here in this too, you know, with lecturers in the form of just in time. That's very relevant, uh, just in time resources and professional development offerings. Another challenge of working with our lecturers is, um, the model of education we have is that uh, they're all contract instructors. 
So just in time resources and professional development is so important because they're working with many mm. other colleges and not with us. And we're not paying them always to learn. Um, so uh, that, that that's the challenge because that is an education model in Canada. Um, many colleges, universities hire contract instructors who are here with us only for four months. Yeah, that definitely impacts things. Wow. Yes, so are people, what are the incentives then to upskill and do professional development? It's their own self-motivation. I think it is their mm. own. You know, you really have to be highly motivated to serve your students, I think. So excellent. Mm. You know, the research which you're doing is excellent, fantastic, and so much, uh, it's of so much relevance in North America too. Mm. Thank you very much, Manisha. We really appreciate it. I see Tony has put a little uh, link to a form in the chat. So this is for brief feedback about the workshop. So please, if you could complete that short form. Um, perhaps I know we're already on the half hour. So I just want to go through these, these next, um, just quickly next slides. Sometimes positionality, you know, we, we might design a framework. So this is um, an article with colleagues and maybe Manisha, um, you would like this one. It's about academic development as compassionate learning design. Um, so maybe, you know, positionality becomes part of a model. Um, so that's just a, another way where it's not the researchers own positionalities. We've got other papers where we do bring that in, but that this becomes part of, of something that, that we've designed together. Um, based on our own experiences. Um, okay, we're not going to get time just to talk about that, but but just to remind folks as well about the special issue on decolonizing educational technology. Um, the link is in the speaker notes. I can get it to the chat. Um, so if you want to see, read more about it. And perhaps also some last reflections on what does this mean for me and my research? So many of you shared that you are doing research. Um, any final takeaways about what, what positionality means to you and your research? I think this is an excellent question. <laughs> so much, uh, so relevant. Um, uh, depending on which lens are you viewing it, um, you know, is it from um, contemporary uh, or is it from, um, um, uh, you know, my multiple worldviews of being uh, from India, but I've been living in Canada for 30 years and past 15 years with First Nations which lens, you know, this context um, is so important in data interpretation analysis. Um, uh, the positionality, if we, even if we do not take culture into context, I think um, working together, like I'm just thinking of this group dynamics where I have five master students who they'll be graduating um, in July, um, the dynamics are working together. And I'm noticing it's not, culture, because one is a white settler, two are, one is from another nation, not, not from um, this nation, um, Cree nation where I'm working, but Blackfoot nation. Um, and uh, two of them are related to each other. Um, so it's not culture, which, you know, every, we mainly tend to look at positionality many a times from culture, like um, me being from India, but it's not um, just culture worldviews. I think it is um, 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 family relationships which they have and um, working together collaboratively. It's also leadership skills and compassion comes over your, uh, you know, um, big like are the are we dealing with personal egos, um, you know? And there is a lot more deeper into positionality uh, about being valued and appreciated, you know. 
uh, I think it's we uh, one research I want to go back to is 1970s, uh, Compassionate Mind by Walter Lightning. Um, I think um, this presentation is so fantastic. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. And what I'm hearing is that, you know, it's, a, it's not just the thinking of the me, but of the other and our relationships and centering that more in research. Um, and perhaps that's the link with kind of decolonizing um, traditional research approaches. Um, I know we didn't get into that much, but perhaps um, in future seminars in the series, um, this could be a topic we can explore a little bit more. Um, Daniela is saying she's working on her positionality statement. Ah, so you've got to do that in Canada? Uh, well, as um, as a qualitative researcher, yeah, I, I feel that that I, I have to. So yeah, the, this uh, this session was really helpful in helping me to think much more thoroughly about my my position. Um, yeah, then can I just mention something that I forgot to mention when I was talking about my paper? When you're thinking about your positionality, it's very important to also reflect on your understanding of technology and its role in learning. We are looking at positionality in educational technology research and different people, depending on where you are and the research traditions within your context and so on, we understand the role of technology in learning differently. And our positionality should also reflect that. So some people come in with quite a critical perspective in the way they understand it. Um, if I'm in the African context and I have a critical perspective, then I'm looking at the fact that most of the technologies we are using are developed in other parts of the world where they have different assumptions about teaching and learning from the reality that we are experiencing here, the different understandings of access and so on. So when I come in with that mindset already, that influences, that has an influence on positionality as well. Uh, so it's important for you as you are doing your reflections on your positionality. So in other words, how you relate to um, the participants, how you understand the research problem and so on. It's important to also bring in the aspect of technology um, and what that means for how you see technology's role in that context and how people, how you assume people relate to the integration of technology. So if you have a negative mm -hmm. assumption about it, then you'll approach it differently. But if you have quite positive assumptions about it, then your approach and understanding of, of the research problem and the conceptualization of the research problem will also be different. Okay, Nicole, I don't know if you want to summarize. Um... Yes, I think we, it's, we, we kept folks for a long time and had a really uh, vibrant discussion. So thank you everyone. And please remember to complete the short form. I'll put the link in again um, for Tony. It's just brief feedback about the workshop um, that goes to the Emerge Africa web uh, team and to, I think EdTech Hub, Hub is gonna get it as well. Um, so, we were sharing about you know some spaces just to say we we unpacked positionality, people's experiences with with where they encounter it in academia and research, um, and just uh, you know Manisha's point here has you know this I think you're talking about land acknowledgement so physical position and location, so that's often common. Some American universities are doing it, uh, Australian, New Zealand as well. Um, and it's, I think, sometimes up to the person and the kind of institutional, like sometimes there's, there's a preference how they do it. Um, yeah, but that, that's a little bit, uh, I think, a bit different. Um, but it does, I think, uh, impact how people understand positionality, whether they see it as part of that. Um, I mean, I, I can imagine if your, your First Nations, I'm thinking of when I was in Australia and the land acknowledgements were read out. 
how a part of that um, it is. So it might be a cultural, like how the land and the space and the person are actually connected. Um, so how we do these things, you know, it's sometimes like academia might make it a bit of artificial, um, but maybe that's part of the decolonial is how, what are the other ways that one can do this? Um, so I think that's something really interesting and perhaps that we can explore in other places. And thank you, yeah, Ellen, for joining us. It was great to see you here as well. Um, and Manisha, thanks for all your insights. Um, and also to my co-presenter, Nompila, always fun chatting with you. Always. And Danielle, <laughs> <laughs> and Danielle as well. Thank you for being here, Tony, Jakob. Um, and I hope you all have a great day further. <laughs>